I'm Simon Gravel. Um, I, I do population genetics at McGill University in Canada. Um, I have many different you know, areas of research. I chose today to talk about large pedigrees, large genealogies, uh, because it's a fun topic. There's we had some recent cool results, but also there's a long history of cool computational methods that kind of might need revamping and, and re revisiting with all the exciting machine learning methods that people have been developing uh, across different areas of CGSI. So uh, before I start, uh, most of the research work has been done by uh, the two students here, Dominic Nelson and Luke Anderson Truckme, and most of the data comes from actual humans who generously contributed to uh, the, the, these two cohorts here. Okay, I don't think I need to convince anyone that studying the similarities between parents and offspring or between family members it has been important in genetics, right? A lot of the important discoveries that have been made in the field, uh, like Mendel's uh, laws of inheritance, uh, the idea of heritability, uh, of height by comparing parents and offspring height by Galton, uh, the idea of recombination uh, uh, of genetic traits by looking at fruit flies, crossings and similarly like mutagenesis, the appearance of new mutations, these have all been investigated and discovered by comparing parents and offspring. So small genealogies have been really useful, right, obviously. Um, and if people of you work in any of these fields, like complex trait architecture or, or recombination or mutation, you'll know that we don't know these things really, really well yet, right? We have big areas of uncertainty, which maybe we could resolve by just having larger families. If we had like large enough families, maybe we'd be able to figure out mutation rates and exactly where recombinations occur and, and, and resolve some of these areas where we don't know things very well. A complex trait architecture is even more so, right? Because you can try to pick apart environmental uh, and genetic components. Okay, so this is important. Uh, these were small families, typically like one generation. Now, if you started doing genetics a little bit later than that, in the you know, 70s, for example, you will have come across a lot of family structures like this one, where you, know, you have a bunch of affected individuals in a reasonably large family. And out of curiosity, in this room, who has ever actually analyzed a pedigree like that in their research or in their classes? Okay, so it's a very small minority of people today, whereas before, that was the bread and butter of geneticists. And why is that? Well, there's a couple of reasons. Uh, but one of them, of course, is that the field has moved to large cohorts and GWAS. And so why have we moved to GWAS? There's a couple of reasons. One of them is power for some kinds of traits, like complex traits. We might have better power to discover these common variants that explain lots of variation in the population. Generalizability is a big one. Uh, you know, if you do the UK Biobank, you have 500,000 people, you have a whole bunch of phenotypes, and you can study a whole bunch of phenotypes. Whereas when you do family studies for specific diseases, you have to go and collect families for every disease separately, and that's very time consuming. Uh, and that's very costly, right? So it's very difficult nowadays to go and convince a funding agency to give me, to give me personally, money to go and, and recruit a very, very large family, right? It just doesn't work, and I probably wouldn't want to do it anyways because it's too tedious. Um, there are people arguing that we should go back to family studies to answer some kinds of questions about, in particular, heritability. Um, and some people do that, but again, it's difficult to get these large families from a funding perspective. So, we're going to have to be data scavengers, and most of computational geneticists know how to, you know, uh, or data parasites, like use data generated by other people. So we're going to try to go and find large genealogies in the wild. So question for, for you guys, um, where could you find large genealogical data sets if I ask you to go and try to find one in the world? Facebook. Facebook. How would you? <laughs> Maybe. I don't, I don't know how much genealogical information you'll get from Facebook. Um, but like close to Facebook, maybe. Or blood banks. Blood banks. Ah, so, so now you could go get lots of genetic data and try to reconstruct maybe genealogies from those? Oh. Yeah, that's right. So people can go together. I, I don't know if they record like the family relationships between people, though. I mean, maybe they do. Okay, well, that's that's... That's, okay, interesting. I, I hadn't thought about that one. Uh, yes? 
doesn't compromise like uh, my heritage or 23 me information. Right. So this is excellent. This is my next slide. <laughs> uh, so so genealogy companies, right? So a lot of people have great interest in building their genealogical trees because they're curious about who their ancestors are. And there's companies generously helping them to do this in exchange for money and, and then using their data for other purposes. Um, like MyHeritage, like Ancestry.com, many of these companies also encourage pe people to share their DNA because the DNA can help resolve aspects of their genealogies and is also very interesting for research. And people at genealogy companies have written very nice papers using these genealogies. This is just um, one example here. Uh, using the, the MyHeritage data set, they had, like, for example, a single pedigree of 13 million individuals. So you're talking about very nice uh, big data. And they looked at the genetic architecture of human longevity. So why longevity? Well, often when you have these large pedigrees, you don't have you know, detailed phenotype information about individuals because they might be people who lived 100 years ago. But you might ha know when they died, or you might know how many kids they had, or you might know how old they were when they got married. And so people often will look at these kinds of traits. And the other thing they looked at was geographical dispersion of families, which from a PubGen perspective is quite interesting. Like how do people move from where they were born to where they get married, and how does that tie into evolution? Really cool. Um, lots of good scientists uh, doing work there. The data is not you know, publicly available. Uh, so if you want to work with it, you need to find a collaboration uh, with companies in many cases. But you know, this can be done. So there's really cool data sets there. Uh, another one is there's some societies which, for different reasons, uh, were very interested in recording systematically these genealogical relatedness. And a very famous one is in Iceland. So they have, I forget the name of the book, but they have this book where people have been recording genealogical records for hundreds of years. And this data set now is managed by a company called Decode, which also has done a lot of cool research with it. Uh, one result I've been showing to people, and because um, it's, it's kind of interesting from a, a genetics perspective, is they show that as a function of kinship between uh, parents in a, you know, in a, in a couple, a bit, kinship between people who get married together, the number of offspring decreases with increasing... Ugh, uh, people who, are, who have more kinship have more kids, right? Which might be surprising, maybe, because you might expect that more, more relatedness, more inbreeding among the parents would lead to reduced number of offspring. Doesn't seem to be the case. However, what they argued in that paper was that if you have too much inbreeding, your kids don't have kids. So the kids might have the, you know, the, the, the health consequences. And so they argued in this paper that there's a sweet spot. Like you want to be just enough related to have the maximum number of kids evolutionarily. <laughs> um, it's a very interesting and intriguing result. Um, I was told that this result had not been replicated in other genealogies, uh, but this has not been published. So it's still an open question as far as I'm concerned. Very interesting. Um, another, uh, uh, yes. Oh, I actually, well, so kinship, uh, I, so 31, so that means, I'm forgetting what it is, one, two, three. Uh, this is 3%, it's, not, it's actually not that closely related. This would be, these would be like a second cousin or something like that, and then you go, I think you want to be like third to fifth cousin or something, <laughs> if I recall. And third to fifth cousin is pretty far, right? I mean, it's, um, Okay, so yeah, so just as people, if people are planning things, um, <laughs> do not rely on this talk, please. Um, okay, uh, another one I'm going to be talking about today is, is uh, Quebec, French Canadians, and there it was the Catholic Church, it was very powerful, uh, and the priests were like, very good notes of, of who got married and the parents of people who got married, which was very critical because if you have people who got married and their parents in, in the little register, it's very easy to link those. Uh, and so we have... Uh, you know, people since the 1970s by hand have been digitizing these kind of you know, priest scribblings. Uh, and now we have like a one data set with like, you know, six million people in it. One, one large pedigree. It is very complete. It's very nice. So I'm going to be talking about that a little bit later. It's not the only place where we can, uh, but what, one example result that people have um, used this data for, which is kind of related to the decode one, was a paper by Claudia Moreau, where she was comparing uh, how many kids people had as a function of where they lived on the territory. And if people lived in the communities on the, on the expanding front of the colony, they had more kids, a little bit more kids. But then a similar story, 
uh, their kids had a lot more kids, right? And the reason might be if you were in the core of the territory, there's no land available, so it's difficult to get married, it's difficult to settle somewhere. Whereas if you're in the front and you're, you have a large family and you know, just notice 22 and 24 children per woman, okay? So <laughs> talking about large families, if you want to settle, you, know, you, you need a lot of land to go and settle new land. And this was primarily agricultural society. So um, anyways, interesting stuff. Uh, I, I should say other large genealogies in non-humans, uh, in cattle, people have been very interested in cattle pedigrees. And so this is an example of a recent paper with 10 million animals or 9 million animals uh, for, for red dairy cattle. Okay. Here again, these data are not easily available uh, because people want to make money from them. Uh, but collaborations are possible. And another one is endangered species, uh, because endangered species are, are interesting. Often they have small population size, so you can count all the individuals potentially in their relationships. And there's a really nice, nice paper by Nancy Chan, uh, who followed scrub jays uh, and was able to track the frequency of alleles over time and, and how this uh, departed from drift according to genealogy and really cool stuff you can do um, here. So, okay, there's lots of cool um, data sets. They're not all easily available. And so the next question could be, okay, if, if, if we, and for most populations, we don't have this complete pedigree record, right? So could we just go and take the genetic data that we have for large cohorts and learn everything? And to an extent, we can do this, right? I mean, there's companies doing this, and I don't know how many of you did your 23andMe or Ancestry.com, but companies do that, right? And so this is my family trees as reconstructed by uh, 23 and me, and so this is me, and this is some of some relatives whom I've never met, uh, but uh, I guess we're related. Um, and this is pretty typical, I think, where they're able to reconstruct relatedness uh, up to you know second, third cousins, you know reasonably well. But also, uh, if I if I click on the other link on the 23 and me page, it would give me the list of 2,500 people I may be related to more distantly. But it's very difficult to re reconstruct a specific um, relatedness between individuals. And the reason is kind of, um, well, I'm, I'm going to highlight here, uh, but this has been a longstanding problem. People in GWAS studies or in anthropological studies have been interested in learning relationships between people. There's a, a whole forest of methods uh, to do this. And the way most of these methods work is, it, let's say you have a particular relationship between individual A and individual B. In this case, they're half siblings. They're going to have a particular pattern of sharing of identical by descent segments along their genome. Um, and if you compare this to like uncle, uh, nephew, or grandmother, grandchild, uh, in this case, they're all going to have the same degree of relatedness, but their patterns, uh, how the IBD segments are distributed along their genome are going to be slightly different, and you can try to make sense of that. And so one of the best used methods is, is King. It's still used quite frequently. It was published 13 years ago. I'm not going to go into details, but this is kind of classical population genetics where you predict the degree of relatedness for two individuals based on their, um, predict their uh, putative relatedness. And you predict their kinship, how much of their genome they should share. And you predict the, something about how much of this kinship is shared between zero, one, or two copies of their chromosomes. And then you put some lines and you say, these are first degree cousins, these are you know, siblings, these are parent offspring. That works pretty well. Um, I just wanted to highlight, it was a recent preprint uh, by Cole Williams uh, that introduced Ponderosa. So I'm not involved in this work, uh, but this was just doing kind of the same thing but with machine learning. So you, you, you have, you know, enough records, right? You have enough pedigree data to be able to identify thousands of siblings, uh, thousands of uncle nieces, and you can just look at their genomes and learn patterns of relatedness that are shared by uncles and nieces and, and train a machine learning approach, right? There's a couple of very nice things that this does. One is that it um, allows to account for the fact that uh, the Everybody's related in many, many ways, right? If we share two IBD segments, maybe it's because we have one common ancestor through which we inherited these two segments, or maybe we have two different ancestors, shared ancestors. And the, the previous methods didn't really account for that. This approach does this, which is very nice. But one really neat thing as well uh, that I can highlight here, I don't know if you can, you probably can't see the colors, but the points here 
are uh, maternal half-siblings, so they share a mother, and these are paternal half-siblings, and the method is very easily able to tell those apart. Why is that? Biologically, is because the recombination rates are fairly different in males and in females, and it, they are higher in females, if I'm not wrong, and so individuals who share a mother uh, will have shorter, more shorter IBD segments, and this machine learning method was just able to figure it out and is able to learn things. Okay, that's, that's nice. So yes? That's a good question. This is only autosomal. So this is, yeah, of course, if you have sex chromosomes, it's easy. <laughs> uh, it would be easier and would be a good idea, I suppose. Uh, was there another question or? Okay. Oh, yeah. Are there limits of what can be determined known to, in terms of like identifiable to the target? Yeah, I, I don't know if theorems, uh, but I can give you some intuition. So thank you for uh, <laughs> allowing me to, to, to go to this. So, it's fairly easy to, to identify close relatives because they share a lot of DNA. But as soon as you go more than a couple of generations, uh, it gets really hard. It gets impossibly hard because you're going to end up sharing just one segment potentially or zero segments. Of course, if you share nothing, then you, you can't learn uh, the relationship. If you have just one segment, it's very difficult to pinpoint how old it is, right? And so, um, so there's no way of solving this problem by looking at pairs of individuals. Yes? Yeah, so but if I look at the 23 and me results, so I don't have a theorem. If I look at the 20, 23 and me results, they go back like four generations. But how much more information do you get from the target? Sorry, uh, can I? How much more information do you get from the target? Well, you get less and less information as you go further back because you share less and less DNA. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I was thinking maybe it doesn't matter. Oh, I. I so. Ah, so then you're asking downstream, like maybe you don't care about the genealogies going back that far because anyways, you're not going to be using them. Yeah, so it depends on what was the question you're going to be asking downstream, I suppose. Like how, how much do you want to learn these relationships? That's a, that's a separate question, I guess. Um, and so if you, I, I don't know if that, is that answering the question? I, I don't know. Okay, I, um, okay so pairwise uh, doesn't work. Um, you can try to do what 23andMe is doing, is if you have enough individuals, you don't have to just do just pairwise relatedness, you can try to take everybody, and, and by, you can pig, you, piggyback, no, you can da daisy chain <laughs> relatedness, right? You can go from, you know, from me to my first cousin, and then this first cousin is also related to this other person, and you get a bit more information about the ancestors. Um, I don't know exactly what their algorithm is, but right now we're not at the point where we can do a really good job unless you have like almost complete data. Uh, like if I, if I, spend like, you know, $2,000 and ask all my family to go and do 23andMe, then everybody would have their genome sequence in my family, and then 23andMe would, have a good, would be very good at reconstructing probably our, our relatedness. But that's kind of, <laughs> like we already know the relatedness in this case. Um, so in some cases, when you have very complete sampling, you could try to go a bit further, but right now we're not there. Okay. There's another set of methods that are very interesting. Uh, that people that have seen a lot of development recently, and is the idea of reconstructing not the actual pedigrees, so this is a pedigree here, right, but reconstructing just the history of the genes within this pedigree. And I'm just going to ask, because I don't know how familiar people are, uh, who is familiar with these ancestral recombination graphs or with these like tree sequence kind of representation of genetic data? Okay, so, so there's a good proportion of people, but not everyone. And the idea is quite simple in principle. Um, if you take these two, individual, uh, these two haploid copies of the genome of this individual, and, and you trace back their ancestry in the pedigree, at some point you're going to find a common ancestor, right? Uh, if, if, if the pedigree is deep enough, right? So you can record that information and say for these two chromosomes, the common ancestor lived uh, one, two, three generations ago at this position. But because of recombination, each position along the genome follows a different path uh, within the pedigree. And so if you want to record all this information, you can you know, uh, record the relatedness between your individuals as a sequence of trees where you have at each position the, the time at which the common ancestor lived at that position. Now we don't know that right, uh, in, in reality, but you can imagine if you, if you knew everything, you could represent the relatedness between individuals in this way. And the nice thing is that this uh, this gene genealogies, I mean, we, always, we have information about it by definition because we were just focusing on the part 
of, the, of our ancestry where there is genetic material that was inherited. So there's a lot of work in this area. Uh, I'm going to give a little bit uh, of a very quick tutorial about how people can infer those. Uh, but one of the celebrated papers that did this was by Lee and Durbin, who introduced the PSMC method. And the idea here was just to say, imagine we just have two, two haploid copies of the genome, so one individual, one diploid individual. And at each position, we can try to figure out how long did the common ancestor of these two haplotypes uh, existed. We don't know that yet, right? We just, we just have the genomes of individuals today. So we can say, well, that this time where the common ancestor lived is a hidden variable, and we're going to try to learn this hidden variable. And you can, use this, you can do this using hidden Markov models. It's very standard methods. And so this is a, uh, what they're describing here. And this is an example where they simulated the genome, so they know exactly when the common ancestors lived. Uh, this is the red line in their simulation, and they inferred using hidden Markov models, and they do a re re reasonably good job, and then you can do population genetics from there. So that was, that, that's cool. Um, people have followed up on that. Um, one nice paper uh, was uh, Arg Weaver, which I don't have the reference here, I apologize, 2014, uh, where people expanded this to more than one individual, and instead of uh, uh, taking just one individual and finding a time to the most recent common ancestor, you try to learn this tree describing a relationship between all the individuals. And they're doing this by adding, you, you start by reconstructing the tree between individuals one and two, you do a hidden Markov model, then you add another individual and try to figure out where it connects within this genealogy. So you can do that. I'm not going to go too, too much into details. But this is a super active area of research. Argweaver works, I think, for up to 10 individuals. We'd really like to do this for everybody in the population to have good uh, accuracy. And so there's many methods that have been proposed recently. The ones I'm most familiar with are Relate by Lewis Peedle, TS Infer by Jerome Kelleher, and recently Arg Needle uh, by, by Zhang et al. Um, and all these are trying to solve this problem, and all these are able to do it for hundreds of thousands of people. So that's cool. So, okay, so then the next question is, if we have this, can we infer the pedigree? And the answer is no, not yet. Uh, unless you have more individuals, uh, you, know, you, you need to sample the entire population. So fine, let's ask a slightly easier question. Uh, still pretty hard. If you have the pedigree, can you do a better job at learning this relationship between individual? Okay, so this is turning the problem around, but it, it sounds like it should, right? If you know the, the, the pedigree relatedness between individuals, you sh it's a very strong constraint on where the common ancestors might have lived, so you should, in principle, be able to use this information to do a better job at doing that. And so people have done that. Uh, one really nice paper uh, was by Geyer and Thompson in, I, I forget exactly when it was, but it was like 20 years ago or something like that, uh, maybe, maybe 15. And the idea here is very simple. Imagine you have a pedigree, and, you just, and you're interested in one particular mutation, and you want to know who, was the founder, who in the pedigree carries this mutation. Uh, so you're, the state of the system is given by whether you're a carrier or not, like 0 or 1. And then um, you have a likelihood function that's very straightforward, Mendel's laws of inheritance. Uh, so that's what I'm showing here. And then you just try to find a maximum likelihood. Right? You find a maximum likelihood assignment of, of alleles to individuals, and voila, you've solved your problem. Um, unfortunately, this is very challenging. Uh, and the reason it's challenging uh, can be seen in, well, this problem is easy. You can look at this problem, sorry, if you can see. Uh, you have these two individuals sharing an allele, and there's only one common ancestor pair, and so it's easy to do. But in reality, in a pedigree, you'll have a lot of loops. You have lots of common ancestors, and it's very, very difficult for algorithms to explore over this space of states. Because uh, let's say that you, you started with the guess that uh, this, uh, this individual here was a common ancestor of these two um, alleles. Um, and so your, the state of your system is going to be like one, 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 like carrier, 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 and everybody else is not a carrier. And now let's say you want to change your, you know, to change your state a little bit, change your solution, uh, to go and, and now uh, propose the other solution that maybe this individual is the, com the, the relevant common ancestor. You have to make a lot of changes to get from here to, to, to there. Now you have to have all these individuals be carriers, and it doesn't, it doesn't work if you just try to use um, 
Markov chain Monte Carlo methods, which is what they, the people were using for small genealogies. And so what they did here is you improve Markov chain Monte Carlo uh, with an approach called annealing. And what's interesting about this paper is that this, uh, so they, they did this for genealogy of a few hundred individuals. And that method has had a lot of influence outside of genetics. So people have applied this method for complicated, different, diff difficult uh, likelihood problems uh, to, to a whole range of different problems. Oh, and this was just me uh, showing the typical kind of computer science plot of a really bad likelihood that's very difficult to optimize over. Um, okay, um, and I'm probably going to be running crazy. Oh my god, crazily out of time. Um, okay, so we had also a method to, to do this using importance sampling, which is a different method for exploring these likelihood surfaces very uh, effectively. Uh, and one exam example application here is we had this particular disease that was prevalent in the region of Saguenay in Quebec, and we were able to find who were the likely founders 300 years ago who brought this mutation, but also predict where in Quebec should we find carriers of this disease mutations. And of interest, if I have the time to talk about this later on, the Charlevoix region is the region where we predicted to have the highest rate of carriers, even though no cases had been documented in that region yet, because it's a smaller region with less, um, fewer, fewer individuals. Okay. Uh, so I, I, I probably have just a few minutes left. Is that right? Mm, seven. Oh, seven. Okay. I, I, can, I can do it seven. Okay. Um, Okay, so um, da, da, da. so what we'd like to do, though, is not to do this one mutation at a time, but do this for the entire history of, of everyone, right? We just want to say, I have a, a pedigree, I have the genomes of individuals at the bottom, reconstruct everything, go ahead. Uh, and right now, these methods totally don't scale uh, to, to do that, just computationally. Uh, we have enough data to do it. Uh, there's enough constraints to, to, in principle, reconstruct the genomes of these individuals, but we just don't have a good computational method to do it. We're trying to do it, uh, but in the meantime, I, I, we didn't finish in time for this meeting. And so the, the intermediate step is going to be to just say, let's, if we have a genealogy like this, can we simulate the relationship between all the individuals and compare our simulations to what we see in real data? And is that a good model for genetic variation? And so that's what I'm going to be talking about today. Now, the data, as I mentioned, so the, the results are in this paper. It was published uh, a month ago. Uh, and so all the, all the cool population genetics results and history results are going to be in that paper. Um, just a quick background in French Canadian history. So people came from uh, France to uh, Quebec. There were, of course, indigenous people living in Quebec at that time. But out of the 8.6 million individuals in Quebec right now, about 7.3 million are French Canadians. It will come as a huge surprise that I'm French Canadian here uh, at this moment in the talk. Um, and the majority of the ancestry of French Canadians is derived from 8,000 founders that arrived from France. And so now if we have 30,000 genomes from people today, which we do now, uh, we have like a very high coverage of the genomes of these founders, right? So it seems like we should have enough data to figure out what these genomes are. So that's, that's the goal. We won't solve it today, though. Uh, geographically, this is Canada. This is Quebec. Most people live in the southern part of Quebec. Uh, and, and now the colors are difficult, but in the valley of the St. Lawrence River, um, if you take these, you know, tens of thousands of genomes, you do standard genetics, you find population structure. Surprise, surprise. Uh, if you overlay this population structure on a map, so you, now you color people by their genetic coordinates, and what you see is, and the colors are not very good, but you see all these little regional founder effects, right? You see all these regional population structure and continuous variation between these regions. It's, it's all very well and good. And so the next question is, and I'm going to talk about the details. Um, next question is, how far does our genealogy extend? Right? So do we have, uh, essentially, our, does our genealogy make it to point B when the first settlers came to Quebec? Is the structure we're seeing today the result of what happened in France? And then people from different regions of France founding different regions in Quebec? Or do we have a genealogy going all the way here, and everything we're seeing today is a result of what happened in the genealogy? Long story short, we looked for a lot of you know, historical records about French history, migration history, and, there's, and in the genetics, and there's really no evidence that the structure derives from France. It all should be encoded in the genealogy. OK, so to validate this, uh, we need to simulate data in this very large genealogy. I don't have time to go into details, but we did that. We generalized the MS prime simulation framework, which is a super efficient simulator based on backwards in time. 
uh, to take into account this realistic genealogy. And it's very straightforward. You can, there's a couple of lines of command. You can say simulate according to this genealogy. When you get to the top, you say simulate according to some demographic model for, let's say, French founders in this population. Go back in time and you get a simulation for all the genomes of millions of people. So that's kind of neat. Um, and we can validate this by comparing real data, the like PCs, and simulated data. Uh, and, you know, surprise, perhaps unsurprisingly, the genealogy captures the emergence of population structure in this population. Like out of the first uh, nine PCs, we capture eight very well. And there's PC6 that we don't capture for, for very interesting historical reasons that I'm going to have to skip. Uh, if you want to play with these data, because these are simulated, we could just make publicly available a simulated data set of 1.5 million individuals with realistic population structure. You can just go and download it. You don't even have to register. So that's a fun little uh, data set for testing your method to see if it's sensitive to this continuous population structure and founder effects. Uh, and okay, the next question that we spend some time on is on why, what explains this population structure? We're going to have two vignettes. One is, what's very nice about this now is that we have a good model for how genetic variations spread. And we can look at the history of genes in different regions. And so just to put you to scale, this is Montreal. This is where I live here. Uh, this is Rodden. So we rented a cabin there for just uh, when I go back after this meeting. I'm going to spend some time there. Uh, so this is about an hour drive, so 100 kilometers. And you can s see that the path that genes took right, for people who lived in Rodden in the 1960s. And it took about uh, so one hour drive, about 200 years for the genes to go there from one town to the next, which is really cool. And, and Luke has lots of cool visualizations of these kinds of things. But the last one I wanted to talk about is uh, we talked about the saguenay lac saint jean here, which is the region which has a slightly elevated rate of rare diseases because of this founder event, uh, such as the one I mentioned here. So we had these cases for this Caid disease uh, located here, and we found that likely the prevalence of carriers was higher here. So what Luke did is quantify where did these founder events occur and in which individuals. So you take two individuals from Saguenay for this region, and you ask where were their common ancestors living. Um, and you find that the vast majority of those are either in Quebec City, where the first French settlers came in, but also mostly in this region, which is Charlevoix. And I don't have the time, so I'll just have to leave you to, to a completely misleading slide. But uh, we could pinpoint exactly why this bottleneck occurred. And it's because of a meteorite impact that occurred in that area. And it's true. Um, OK, fine, I'll tell you. Uh, the, 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 <laughs> uh, the meteorite impact occurred uh, like 300 million years ago. But the geological conditions it created were perfect to have a small population isolated and, and demographic pressures and then leading to the bottleneck. So, but it's still, it's, it's, it's still the, 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 the uh, meteorite's fault. And, and it confirms the founding myth that French Canadians come from space. Um, OK, so, so, so I'm just going to conclude by saying that obviously this kind of data sets are really cool for understanding human evolution. Lots of uh, important questions about you know, meiosis about complex traits, um, about history, um, but also a lot of really cool computational problems uh, that are really well posed and just need a good solution. Um, and I'll stop here with my acknowledgement slide.